Our gracious Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the, op the opportunity and the privilege that's ours to worship you, to concentrate upon the greatness and the glory and the wonder of our God. So thankful to be able to feast upon your precious word. We commit this time to you asking that the Holy Spirit would set it aside for his glory, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our attention might be directed to the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I ask that you would strip away all of that which is foolish, all the error and the deceit, so that only truth remains. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I hope everyone is doing well. We are going through Philippians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we'd reached uh, the, uh, we're getting close to the end of the first chapter, somewhere around verse 25, 26. And no doubt we are looking at the Apostle Paul in a Roman prison, writing to a group of believers at a town called Philippi. And as I pointed out previously, we see in this epistle, the heart of God is addressing his message to the believers at Philippi. And of course, he's also addressing the epistle to us. We know that Paul is, is set forth as a prototype uh, for all of those who should hereafter believe. Uh, we're told that in Timothy. And I pointed out that our hero here is not Paul. Our affection, our uh, adoration is not Paul, not the Apostle Paul. And I see so much of that in the literature that I look at in the commentaries that are written on this epistle, as well as other Pauline epistles. Our adoration is not centered in Paul, but in Christ. And so we have the Holy Spirit addressing a message to those believers who had rejoiced in the knowledge that they are one with God through the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we study through these letters to the churches, and we've studied through quite a few uh, since the Revelation 12 sign, so many in fact that I've, I've thought of actually having all of the videos transcribed uh, into a commentary, a New Testament commentary, if we ever reach that point, if we ever get that far. Of course, my hope is that the Lord will take us home. But I find it striking that in the passage, given that we're, the particular passage we're looking at, and in the relationship of the timing of this study in regards to the prophetic timetable that we've been looking at in 2021, I don't, I don't really see that as a coincidence. Our affection is not centered in Paul, but it's in Christ and through the, the person and the work of Christ. That's where our focus, our attention is supposed to be. Not on Paul, not on emulating Paul, uh, which is law. If we just simply read all of this and, and read it in the sense that we're just being given uh, a list of instructions on how to live the Christian life. And, and if we follow those instructions to the letter, then we do better. And if we don't, then well, we don't. And that's not what I see in the text at all. All of this is marvelous truth that, that they had. Uh, but, you know, it's wonderful, Paul, that you're writing all this, but we still got to keep the law. And we still got to be circumcised. So we have the, the Holy Spirit addressing a message to these believers here of comfort, comfort. And in our last, our well, our past several studies, I asked you to think about, or I asked you to, to think beyond Paul and see the heart of God himself who longs for, for fellowship and he longs for oneness with his people, uh, even longs for our being present with him. The, the ultimate program uh, 
God's plan is that we will all, as members of the body of Christ, be with Him, and we shall be with with we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We have revealed in verses 21 through 26 the heart of God and His love for us, and, and that God longs for that fellowship. And we are not raptured because uh, at the present time we're still here because it's needful for us. It's necessary for us to be here because we're here for one another. But not just that we're here for one another, but that the Holy Spirit is here. If there wasn't any need for us being here in the situations that we're in, we would be with Him. This is what we need to see in the text. The certainty of our experience has to be vested in our knowledge of the purpose and the program of God. The question is, do we understand the purpose and the program of God during this present age that we're living? Because we are under grace, not law. And we have an abundance of revelation. We have 13 epistles alone, and of just Paul's epistles alone, just those letters alone more than confirm the fact that we are not under law but we're under grace i see god longing that i depart and be with him but th that it's necessary that i be here and since it's necessary that i be here it's necessary that the holy spirit be here and it seems like the purpose of that and the evidence of that necessity is, is that our rejoicing may be more abundant in jesus christ You know, uh, many Christians may not care about fruit bearing in particular. You know, just give me heaven when I die. But I assure you that God is concerned about that. That our rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. It's interesting Greek as you read it. In order that your boast, that is your boast in Christ. Now, I see that as my boast about Christ. I don't see that as the word boast used in the sense of, of you know, boasting in the flesh. The reason it's needful for the Holy Spirit to be here is because I'm here. And the reason I'm here is in order that my boast or my rejoicing about Christ might be more abundant in Christ and in the Holy Spirit by means of His presence with me. That's the way I read that verse. Looking then at the 27th verse, we now know that God is with us. He's here because we're here, and we're here because it's necessary to be here. And the purpose of that is that our rejoicing may be more abundant. I spent some time uh, the past few videos pointing out, that actually I've spent time in previous videos, uh, uh, quite a few, a uh, number of videos, but... But in the past few videos of just of this present study, I spent some time pointing out that our life, our life is Christ, okay? Is Christ. Big difference in, in, in saying that our life is to do this for Christ or this for Christ or, or this or that or the other thing for Christ. Our life is Christ. And if I, and if I look only at the near application, we get, we've got a, this guy, Paul, who loves the Lord. We know he loves the Lord. He's in prison, and he has a heart of compassion for believers in a town called Philippi. And he's heard that there are those suggesting that they ought to keep the law. And we have, and I'll remind you, the entire epistle to the Galatians, which was also written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through Paul, addresses the very problem of legalism as it exists in the church today. Uh, the entire epistle to, uh, to the Galatians was a, a written to address the problem of legalism in all of its vain glory. And so, He's heard that though there are those that are suggesting that they ought to keep the law, and we have a, uh, uh, and so we have a, 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 a short letter of love and comfort to these believers here at Philippi. So it's a letter of comfort and a, a letter of appeal to unity. Unity, and 
And Paul sits in a prison cell chained to a Roman soldier. And he writes, my life is Christ. And that just fits perfectly with everything else. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. So obviously to die is gain. My life is Christ. I'm going to appear with him in glory. So to die is gain. And I want you to stop and think that there may be something beyond just the mere physical aspect of that verse or those words that we're looking at here. To die is gain. Is It's also true that to die to self is gain. Now, we know that we've died to self. It's not something that we need to die of. We just need, we got to crucify the flesh. We've got to die to self. We've got to die to the law. We have to die to the world, the flesh, the law, sin. We've got to die to sin. Have you died to sin? If you haven't, man, you need to die to sin. Folks, it, that's not what our text says. We have died. Ye have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It's not that we need to die to sin, self, the law, the world, the flesh, you know, but that we have died. And so to die is gain. In the spiritual sense, to die to self, to sin, to, to the law, is gain. So I, I see also see that in the text. I wanted to make sure I pointed that out. I don't know if I, if I did in my previous video, but that is exactly the way I look at that. It, that makes sense to me. There's both a, a physical as well as a spiritual aspect of this. Verse 22, since I'm living in the flesh, then this obviously works fruit. In other words, I wouldn't be able to have that fruit if I were not in the flesh. I mentioned to one of a, uh, one of our viewers who came to visit me, uh, uh, a couple uh, from Arizona that came to visit me some time ago, and, and I pointed out the fact that that was exactly how I viewed their coming to see me. That that I wouldn't, uh, or I, I, what I would suggest is they wouldn't be able to, to have that fruit, okay, of coming to, to minister to me, to see me, to visit me to share the gospel, the good news with me, to fellowship in the spirit with me. They wouldn't be able to have that fruit if they were not in the flesh. And that is true in, in all every the case of all of us. Uh, now, I haven't yet perceived, Paul says, what I would choose because I'm really held between the two. You know, I'd, I'd prefer to depart and be with Christ. That sounds better. In fact, the text clearly says it is better. On the other hand, I'd prefer to be here because that's necessary for you. So I haven't perceived yet what God wants me to do, says Paul. However, since I know that it's important for you, it's needful for you that I abide or I remain in the flesh, then I have that confidence that I'm going to remain in the flesh as long as it's needful for you. That's the way I read it in the near application. But the language is such that I came to the conclusion that there's more here than just the heart of Paul. If I look at the heart of God, then it all falls into place beautifully. I see the longing of the Holy Spirit for that oneness when we're all together with Christ. And if we jump to the end of the chapter, which I really hate doing, but if we do that, and it's almost irresistible for me to do that, but if we do that, if we jump to the end of the, of the chapter, it looks like an aspect of God's grace is to give us a walk that involves trust as well as suffering. Because it's not only been granted for us to believe in Him, but to suffer for His sake. If you never had any suffering or never had any difficulty, then how would you know that you had faith? So I'm going to suggest that it, it is inconceivable to talk about belief and trust and confidence apart from suffering. If there's going to be substance to our boast in Christ, it's then necessary that we be here, but in, the, but in the, the necessity of us being here, we have to learn faith through suffering. Something that most of Christianity today really prefers not to think too heavily about. It's not their favorite topic. I mean, I mean, why can't I just, you know, 
why can't I just be given a glorified body and go to heaven? Or, or if I can, if I have to be here, then I mean, God owns a, a, a he owns everything. He's he owns he's a thousand cow, cattle on a thousand hills. Why can't I have a nice padded cross while I'm here? I don't want all these difficulties and hardships and trials and sufferings and stuff. And I don't need that. I don't need that in order to believe God and trust God and have confidence in God. I don't need all that all that hard stuff. I I can trust God just fine without all the suffering is what we are we tend to think and that's not what the text is saying you know just to have a nice padded cross you know while we're here you know that old rugged cross that can be pretty pretty tough especially if our suffering is a result of our own stupidity or our own foolishness personally folks i cannot conceive of a sovereign god who would be able to place into this perfect creation some measure of boasting without any experience of the walk. Therefore, it has been given to us not only to trust Him, but to suffer for Him. And I'm told that we're filling up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. They're not redemptive sufferings. We're not going to suffer in any way redemptively, but I am told by the Holy Spirit not to be amazed when the ecclesiastical system hates me because it hates Christ. And before we leave this chapter, we, we see, we will see, that's a token of our relationship to Christ. And the Greek word token means a proof, evidence. The purpose of this is that our boast in Christ might be more abundant. Not that we might not have a boast in Christ if we died in Christ as an infant or if we were, you know, aborted uh, in the womb or... Uh, for whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Both, both exist in perfect union and fellowship with Christ in glory. So there's a purpose and a plan in God. Uh, in David's life, in the things that happened in David's life, including, I believe, the murder of Uriah, that, that, you're, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, or as the Greek says, in Christ Jesus. Since the Holy Spirit has told us that it's necessary that He be here with us and that we be here. I mean, exactly why, I don't know. I don't know why you're here, folks. Uh, I don't know what the Lord's doing in your life. I do know that the future things belong to the Lord. He hasn't told us what lies ahead. What He's told me is that He's with me. Therefore, I can have absolute confidence. I can learn that in whatsoever state I find myself, I can learn to be content because He's with me. I can learn that, 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 there's, that it, He knows the way that I take. And when He's tested me, and there's not one indication, folks, in the verse that he will not test me. In fact, the verse seems to strongly say that he will. When he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. I'm to have confidence in him because after I've suffered a while, he himself will establish and strengthen me. We saw how the Holy Spirit spoke to the church of Smyrna. If those of you who followed me through the book of Revelation, saying that they would have tribulation 10 days. He doesn't give them any option for getting out of it or of escaping it. Well, it may be 10 days, may not be 10 days, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. He said 10 days. He doesn't give them any option for, for escaping it. God makes a simple, straightforward statement in the Old Testament. He says, when I bring the cloud, I will place the bow in the cloud as an evidence that, that he won't again destroy mankind with a flood. And we've all seen that bow in the cloud. But very few seem to see, uh, take the time to stop and realize that what he's saying, that, that what he says is when I bring the cloud, 
God doesn't hide from me the fact that it is he who brings the cloud. So since it is he who brings the difficulty, why then is my study scattered with articles, littered with articles and messages from people who say God doesn't want you to suffer? And that suffering is an evident token. It's, it's, it's obviously a proof of your unbelief or your lack of trust, or it's a proof of the presence of sin in your life. Why am I told that God only brings the good and has no control over the bad? It isn't really God that did this. Sin did this. God says, when I bring the cloud, I will also place the bow in the cloud. It's the mature Christian who walks through life not looking back. I've said before, I believe that, that regret it lies at the very heart. In fact, regret is the heart of atheism. And that's, that's hard. That's hard for anybody. In, in, I believe it is, or it would be in, for anyone in or out of, out of Christ. It's a... You know, we, we tend to, as humans, look back and we have regrets. You know, it's just almost impossible, it seems not to. But, uh, I think the greatest tendency is, is uh, to atheism among Christians is, is, to, is to really always look back and regret the past. It's, we're just so good at that. When what we ought to be doing is rejoicing in the fact that the Lord, the God who brings the bow, also brought the cloud. But, you know, here I find myself, I'll say, but Lord, I love that old truck, that old pickup truck. And now here it sits, it's a piece of junk. You know, when he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God went to great lengths to teach me patiently and lovingly that He wants me to worship Him and to trust Him. I praise God that I can see a God who brings the cloud, who tests me, who says in Peter, after that you have suffered a while, will, He'll make me perfect, establish, strengthen, settle me. And yet with a body of Scripture like that, somebody will call me on the phone late at night to tell me God doesn't want me to suffer. That God doesn't want us to suffer. And if you do, it's because you're sinning. Now, folks, I'm not going to say that suffering may not accompany sin. I am confident that if you went downtown and you robbed First National Bank, you'd probably get caught and go to jail. But don't blame God for that. You know, you can, you can call it a result of sin if you want to, but I see God working in me. And, and if He puts me in prison, He has me there for my good. My concern is not is not looking back, but learning to trust Him, regardless of my present difficulties, my hardships, my sufferings. If you rob a bank, you're not suffering for righteousness there, okay? You can say that God is bringing suffering for sin, and I say, no, Christ suffered for sin. You are simply suffering as a result of the system that's been laid down. Now, I don't know whether I've made that clear or not, but even in that situation, I know that God is working in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. No escaping that. Nothing I could do will alter that, the truth of that fact, that He works in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. No doubt David was condemned under the law that existed, and God took care of that in the Lord Jesus Christ. David's sin was covered by the blood of Christ. So we come to our manner of life here. Only let your conversation, the text says, amazing word, conversation. Now, if you have the authorized version, you don't even have to look at the Greek. You know what the word conversation means, but, but this is not the one that's normally used. This is our word politics, okay? But I, also, I don't want to use that, that word politics in the, same, in the same frame of reference in which you normally use it or think about it. Because what it speaks of here is conduct in the body. Body politics is basically what the text is saying this being the body of christ your conduct in the body of christ that's what it's saying not conduct in the sense of becoming closer to god being becoming acceptable to god 
but conduct that reflects the truth of just how close to God that you are. And we have a tremendous move today to get you closer to God. Folks, you couldn't be any closer to God. You've died and, and your life is hid with Christ in God. We need to realize more and more that we're living our lives within the body of Christ. We're not any better than any other member of the body of Christ. And we're certainly not some island on our, of our own here. We're not, any, we're not any closer to glory than, than someone else. We haven't been blessed above and beyond any other believer in Christ. We've all been blessed with this, with this, every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Okay? That's not how modern Christianity views it, but that's how the book presents it. Okay? And it, it, it's always been a, a burden. I've always carried a heavy burden over the fact that so many believers fail to live. It's not that it, to live up to who we are in Christ, to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, we first have to need to understand what the gospel of Christ is and, and how we uh, come into, a, 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 how we are related to that gospel of Christ. Your conduct in the body of Christ. That's what it's saying. And, and so we've got this tremendous movement going on in, in, in the present time, uh, this in the age of history, the history of grace, in which the, the whole move is, is, in, is, in, is intended to get you closer to God. You couldn't be any closer than what you already are. And, and no member of his body is any better than any other member of his body. Okay? I don't know why that's the, more Christians today don't find that to be such a comfort and a blessing. Just that alone. Just to realize that God really loves you. Not, not the, you know, if, look, if we lose sight of the fact that we're all members of the one body of Christ, we become isolated. We become isolated individualists. And it's an easy step from there to conclude, well, God really loves me, and, but in all the rest of these dumb slobs, he just can't understand them at all. You know, what, what it's saying is, let your conduct within the body of Christ be equal to Christ's gospel. Let your manner of conduct in the body of Christ be equal to the good news that Christ is proclaimed. Let your manner of life within the body of Christ be equal to Christ's good news. Now that all fits. And what is the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ? It's that he died in your place. Not just yours, but every member of the body of Christ. And God hasn't done for you any more than he's done for any other member of the body. And, you know, and, and every part of me wants to shout out to you, you know, the, you people that are, are going about the Christian life as if somehow that's not the, the case at all. That he's done more for me than he's done for someone else. And I just want to say, yell, stop. Okay. That is not what the text is teaching at all. God has not singled you out over any other member of the body of Christ and, and and conferred a special grace or blessing upon your life. He hasn't done that. Sorry, he's not done that. You don't have one verse of Scripture to substantiate such a claim as that. No, God hasn't singled you out over any other member of the body. From, from my poor human position, I, I would be forced to believe that God Almighty loved Caleb more than he loved any of the other members of the, of, of the household of Israel. That is not true. We then suddenly make God's love based on merit and not on grace. We then fall back into that tendency toward humanism, which says that the reason God loves you is because there's something in you to be loved. I hate to break it to you but there's not, okay? 
And that really bothers me when Christians talk about wondering why God loves them because that infers that there's a reason that God loves you other than the fact that you're His own. You know, you're lovable and somebody else isn't. And, that, and that's, why, that's why God loves you. Folks, if you think that, you have suddenly degenerated to the horror and the blasphemy of human merit. And somehow we're led to believe that the proclamation of the good news is that there could, well, that could be true of us if we want it to be. You know, if you would just somehow assert yourself and we make the good news something that God never made it at all. The good news is not you could be if you wanted to be. The good news is you are because Christ died in your place. Now let your manner of conduct within the body of Christ be equal to that. Live as who you are, not as who you're not, or, or some, something that you're trying to become. Not, and let your manner of conduct within the body be equal to that, not just for yourself, but in the recognition of all, other, all the other members of the body of Christ. That means that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your conduct that you stand together in one spirit with one soul or mind. As athletes, that's the Greek word, athletic striving together in the gospel. Not in your trust in the gospel, but in the gospel of Christ. Okay, I see in the 27th verse a looking forward to the time the Lord Jesus Christ returns with the saints and will be with him. Where will our conversation be then? I'll tell you where it'll be. It'll be where it should be now. A complete body. Nothing lacking. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, God sees the body of Christ as perfect. No wonder Paul says, make my joy complete. We'll pick up here next time. I love you all. I truly do. We've had some flooding here, a lot of rain. And so, you know, we're stepping around, sidestepping around a little mud here and there. I just want to, to take a moment to just thank you all for all of your continued interest in these studies which don't get a whole lot of views we're i'm dedicated to completing philippians lord willing and i just want to thank you for all of your kind messages of comfort and support until next time this is steve thanks for watching